<laughs> All right, this is History of the Mound Builders by Ralph and James Boggs. Uh, I grew up in a house with Charlie Boggs, so you know what I'm saying? Shout out to the Boggs if they connect back to the Cherokee also, I think, like Dutch or something like that. But shout out to them. The Mound Builders of his Mongoloid ancestry found a rare interest to the Ohio country and the wander about the Mississippi and Ohio Valley for perhaps 10 centuries. The lineage of the Napa the Delaware lived many hundreds of years ago, far from the west where they left their old home and migrated towards the rising sun. They left Asia and migrated towards the rising sun. And after a very long journey, they arrived at the shores of Napa the Mississippi. The Great River, or the River of Fish. Their journey was slow, and many nights, years, were passed on the way. The reckon uh, the reconnoitering parties of Lenny Lenape reported that in a country to the east were many large towns on the Great River, which flowed through the land. The people were all tall and stout, and they called themselves the Talagay or the Alagay, or the Tsalagi, that would be your, your, your Cherokee. As the Lerte, as the Lenape pushed on some of the men, uh, their, what the, uh, the, the, what the, Moe, the wise men were attacked and killed, and were result, uh, resulted with the Tilasagi. This blood strife continued for several generations to the north where the the Talamantan were offered aid on the condition that they be in the division of the spoils. Great battles were fought. The Talagi fortified their towns and erected earthworks, but many were slain. And realizing that the, uh, the contest would end in annihilation, the remnants of the Talagi abandoned their country and fled southward into Mexico. Now let's go ahead and slide into I'm gonna hit pause and it's gonna be on my business. the traces of which would remain at least eight or ten centuries. The great mound of Cohokia is evidently constructed with as much regularity as any of the tier chali of New Spain, and was doubtless cased with brick or stone, and crowned with buildings, but of these no traces remain. Near the mound at S. Lewis, there are a few decaying stones, but which may have been casually brought there. The Pyramid of Papantla, in the northern part of the intendancy of Vera Cruz, unknown to the first conquerors and discovered a few years ago, was still partly cased 32 with brick. We might be justified 33 in considering the mounds of the Mississippi more ancient than the Tio Chali, a fact worthy of notice, although the stages are still plain in some of them, the gradations or steps have disappeared in the course of time the rains having washed them off. The pieces of obsidian or flint are found in great quantities near them, as is the case with the Tio Chali. Some might be startled if I should say that the mound of Cohokia is as ancient as those of Egypt. The Mexicans possessed but imperfect traditions of the construction of their Tio Chali. Their traditions attribute them to the Toltecs or to the Olmecs who probably migrated from the might be started 11 one should say that the mound of Cohokia is as ancient as those of Egypt the Mexicans possessed but imperfect traditions of the construction of their Tio Chali their traditions attribute them to the Toltecs or to the Olmecs who probably migrated from the Mississippi who will pretend to speak with certainty as to the antiquity of America the races of men who have flourished and disappeared of the thousand revolutions which like other parts of the globe it has undergone? 
The philosophers of Europe, with a narrowness and selfishness of mind, have endeavored to depreciate everything which relates to it. They have called it the New World, as though its formation was posterior to the rest of the habitable globe. A few thirty-four facts suffice to repel this idea. The antiquity of her mountains, the remains of volcanoes, the alluvial tracts, the wearing away of cataracts and in the number of primitive languages, greater perhaps than in all the rest of the world besides. The use of letters and the discovery of the mariner's compass, the invention of gunpowder and of printing have produced incalculable changes in the old world. I question much. L-I-N-A-P-I annals. 12. The fish resort to the shores of the gaping sea, where tarried the fathers of White Eagle and White Wolf. Wapanewa, Waptamwe. 13. While our fathers were always boating and navigating, they saw in the east that the snake land was bright and wealthy. Here begins a fine poetical rhyming NAR rated. See last note. 14. The head beaver Willamock and the big bird Kikolin were saying to all, let us go to the Snake Island Ackerman. 15. By going with us, we shall annihilate all the snaking people we make in. 16. Having all agreed, the northerlings and easterlings went over the water of the frozen sea to possess that land. 17. It was wonderful when they all went over the smooth deep water of the frozen sea at the gap of the Snake Sea in the Great Ocean. 18. They were ten thousand in the dark, who all go forth in a single night in the dark, to the snake island of the eastern land Wananaki in the dark by walking. Yes. Humboldt has mentioned the glyphical symbols of the hinds on wood, seen by the Jesuits. Sticks of the Anapis, but did not describe them. He merely translated some of their traditional tales, which agree in the main with these historical songs, yet the songs appear mere abridgments of more copious annals or the bases of the traditions. The Minewas or Chipewas, the Ottawas, the Sakis and Shawanas and C. All Lenape tribes have such painted tales and annals called Neobagan, male tool by the former. Tan N.E.R. has figured some of these pictured songs and neobagging in his interesting narrating. Moskiel has stated that the Lena P.I.S. had complete genealogies with symbols expressing the deeds of each king. Baby in 1766 saw records 370 years old. Out of these materials and other kept by the Ozages, Coetas, Sunukis, Panis, and C might be formed or restored a peculiar graphic system of North America, different from the Mexican system, and probably once imported from Asia, where it may be compared with the graphic symbols of the curls, yakets, coriax, and sea, indicated by Humboldt, but which are unknown to me. Meantime, I shall give materials for such researches in my illustration. The symbols, when met alone, were inexplicable, but by obtaining the There, Q26. King afterwards was Alcosahit, 27 preserving keeper, who had a royal soul, and was very useful, 27. King afterwards was Shiwapi, 28 salt man, and afterwards dry he pank. Wanwe 29. 28. There was no raining, and no corn grew, east he goes far from the sea. 1729. Over hollow mountain Oliganunk, at last to eat he went at a fine plain Kalak. Whamming of the cattle land. 30. After Pankwanwe came Wekwo Chela, 30 much weary, after such the stiff, Chingle Sui 31. 31. After such was Quitacoon 32 the 12. 134. L-I-N-A-P-I annals. Reprover. 
who was disliked, and some unwilling to obey. 32. Being angry some moved easterly, and secretly went far off. 3D Song, From the Missouri to the Mississippi and Sea. Years have been perforated, and from the strongly attached oxide of copper at those points, there can be little doubt they were decorated with rings or pendants of that metal, but the action of the sacrificial fires has only left an uncertain trace of the character of such ancient modes of personal adornment. Various other portrait sculptures and terracottas, either found in the mounds or discovered within the region where they chiefly abound, are figured in the works of Squire, Schoolcraft, and others, and in the American Ethnological Society's transactions. The majority of them are inferior to those already described as works of art. But if they possess any value as Indy, Google, 468, Prehistoric Man, Chap, Cations of the physiognomical type of ancient American races, they tend to confirm the idea of a prevailing diversity, instead of a uniformity of cranial form and features. From the examples thus referred to, it is obvious that the discovery of a sculptured head of the most strongly marked Indian features, among so many of a different type, in the mounds of the Mississippi Valley, would only correspond with another interesting fact, that animals foreign to the region, and even to the North American continent, are found figured in the mound sculptures. It presents a parallel to well-known examples of Etruscan vases, molded in the form of Negroes' heads, and of Greek pottery, painted with the characteristic Negro features and woolly hair. Specimens of both are preserved among the collections of the British Museum and furnish interesting evidence, alike of the permanency.
instances, animal shape faces. It is not strange that people who have successfully engaged in modeling of life forms, especially the heads of animals, should attempt the human face. Their remarkable success in their direction is shown in a number of faces, one of which is given in figure four, uh, 420. This is a kindred people had made considerable progress in carving in stone and other materials, uh, inventing and deciding talent for sculptures, but clay is so much more readily manipulated than e either wood or stone or shell uh, that we are not surprised to find their best work in that material. It's an interesting fact that with all this cleverness in the handling of clay and in the De, uh, delineation of varied models. The art had not freed itself from the parent stem, the vessel, and launched out into an independent field. In few cases, such as the end, it seems to have been achieved by certain groups of mound builders, notably those who worked in Madisonville, Ohio. So, Madisonville, that ain't that far from motherfucking West Jefferson. You go down there to the mad house in Mad Town, that's where they lock up everybody. That's Gladiator Camp. You go down there and learn to use them hands. Shout out to my, my niggas out there, 15, 20 deep in a motherfucking pod. You know what I'm saying? Trying to get through it. You know what I'm saying? Head up, eyes open, man. We love y'all. You know what I'm saying? Get your head together. Come up out of there. Have it recently been explored by the Professor Putman. Modeling in clay was probably confined to the vessels for that reason that through the humble agency, the art was developed. Up from the present time, I have met with but eight of these curious head-shaped vases. All were obtained from the vicinity of Pecan Point, Arkansas, and like other vessels have been associated with the human remains in graves or mounds. It is true that in the case, in cases, the bones or the dead have not been found, but this only indicates their complete decay. The question, I mean, them bones are old as fuck, they're completely gone, like this, okay, the question as to whether or not these vases were made exclusively from a uh, specular purpose must remain unanswered. There is no source of the information upon the subject, such as the purposes, however, to suggest in case by the semblance of death given to the faces. The finest example yet found is shown in figure 420. In the form, it is a simple head, five inches in height and five inches wide from ear to ear. The aperture of the face is in the crown and I surrounded by the low upright rim, slightly recurved. The cavity is rough, finished, and of uh, follows pretty close to the contour of the exterior surface, excepting in the projecting features such as the ears, lips, and nose. The walls are generally from one-eighth to one-fourth of an inch in the thickness, and the base being about three-eighths. The bottom is flat, and it takes the level of the chin and jaw. And the material does not differ from that of the other bases, and in some localities there are large percentages of shell, mm, some, some practical, uh, which are quite large. These pa uh, paste is yellow, gray in color, and rather coarse in texture. The vase was molded in a plain clay and permitted, and per and permitted to harden before the device was engraved. This after this is a thick film of fine yellowish gray clay was applied to the face, uh, partially filling up the engraving lines. The remainder of the surface, including the lips, uh, received a thick coat of dark red paint. So you telling me this motherfucker right here was in blackface? I ain't never heard of yellowish gray clay, but we're going to get into that. We're going to see what this. I don't know how we got into that. So we're going to leave that alone because <laughs> they're saying it's like dark poop. All right, it's like good.
Let's check this face out. That's, that ain't a Negro. I don't know what is. <laughs> My little brother Vincent. Illustration will convey a more vivid, you know, conception of the striking hair than any description that can be given. The face cannot be said to have a single feature strongly characteristic of Indian physiognomy. So, who's in the mouth? You know what I'm saying? We, we're really trying to figure out when motherfuckers went from Papua New Guinea looking, Luzia looking people to a Asian, you know what I'm saying, Mongolian kind of mix, you know, which is no disclaimer to your, your, your native title to the land. I won't say indigenous, but native title. If you didn't mix in with these original mound builder peoples, then you have no Aboriginal title. That's why they put you on reservation. This is why they treat you like they do, because they know once we go into court, they're just going to pull this on you. So basically the thing what we're saying is right here, through the respect of the mound builders or the original indigenous Negro, you, once, you've been, once you give us our credit, then, you know, we can respect the clause that we had and what y'all know about the Eastern Gate. Y'all were not supposed to come past the Mississippi. You did as the West Coast and you enslaved everybody on the Southern Coast and the Mississippi Valley on down. In that terms, we violated the treaty. Secondly, even though it was violated first, we went on and, you know, took it to the next level by coming our West and attacking everybody with the white boys or the Moors on our way into Mexico. Just, you know, a dirty game we've been playing with each other. So let's just get back to this. Okay, we had instead the round forehead and the projecting mouth of the African. The nose, however, is small and the nostrils are narrow. The face would seem to be that of a young, a youngish person, perhaps a female. The features are all well molded and are so decided. Uh, decidedly individual in character that the artist must have had his mind a pretty defined conception of the face to be produced as well as of expression appropriate to it before beginning his work it was to it will be impossible however to prove that the portrait of a particular personage was intended the closed eyes the rather sunken nose and the parted lips were certainly intended to give the effect of death. The ears are large, correctly placed, and well molded. They are perforated all along the margins, thus revealing a practice of the people to whom they refer. The septum of the nose appears to have been pierced, and the horizontal depression across the upper lip may indicate a former presence of a uh, suspended ornament. Get back in there on that face one more time. It's just like your old neck head. Perhaps the most unique and striking feature is the pattern of incised lines that cover the greater part of the face. These lines are deeply engraved and somewhat scratchy and will apparently ex uh, were apparently executed in the hardening clay before the slip was applied. The left side of the face is plain, with the exception of the figure somewhat resembling a grappling hook in outline with the uh, partially surrounded the eye. The right side is covered with a comb-like pattern placed vertically with the teeth upward. The middle of the forehead has a series of vertical lines and a few short horizontal ones. Just above the root of the nose, there are also three curved lines near the corner of the mouth. Alright, show me the cut. The diagram presented here with figures 421 give in dotted lines the correct outline of the front face and show project, uh, projected in solid lines the engraved figure. The significance of the marking can only be surmised in the most general way. 
their function is probably the same as that of a tattooed or painted figure upon the face of living races. It will be observed that upon the forehead at the top, there is a small perforated knob or loop. Similar appendages have been seen upon many of the clay human heads from this valley and Mexican terracotta heads now in the museum in Mexico has a like feature and at the same time has closed eyes and an open mouth. The headdress should be noticed. It is, seems to have been molded after the cloth or skin cap is intended is extended over the forehead, falls back over the back of the head, and terminates in the point behind the scene of figure 422. Two layers of the material are represented, the one broad and the other narrow and pointed, both being raised a little above the surface upon which they rest. This face head is somewhat smaller than the average human head. Head shaped face. There we go. We got another guy, another brother with his eyes shut, big lips. Another very similar characteristic now down for the museum in about one half size. This face is much uh, mutilated. A third of somewhat larger than the one illustrated, but it is nearly the same finish and color. The face also has a semblance of death, but the features are different, possessing a very uh, decided Indian characteristic. There is no tattooing. All of these heads, included also some of those in the, nation, the National Museum, like the conception and execution. The fact was forcibly and uh, forcibly impression upon the mind in the study of family. Okay. We'll be right back.